Good morning, good morning, Rabbi Hutai. Welcome back to Breakfast in the Class. Breakfast in the Class today is sponsored and dedicated loving memory of Vanessa's mother, Diana Kohen Aleah Shalom Lino Shmat Diana Bat Sofi for Charles. Aleah Shalom, sponsored by Vanessa and Joe God. Also, dedicated loving memory of Lino Shmat Joseph Major Aleah Shalom. Yosef Ben Rina Victoria. Um, her father's favorite parasha, Ni Yosef, and for the Askara of our grandfather, Morris H. Levy and Moshe Ben, Moshe ben Victoria. Aleah Shalom, sponsored by Reina and Ezra Cohen and Raquel and Gabby Habert. Uh, today's breakfast on the class is dedicated for speedy and complete for Hashem for Shemuel Ben Geraz, as well for a for Hashem for Chana Matzim Afega and Eliyahu Shemuel Mazaf Fortune. The week of COVID was sponsored by David E. Ash in honor of you and your substantial capacity to good today and every day. My friends, I want to read you an uh, interesting pasuk. The pasuk tells us that when Yaakov Avinu is calling in his son Yosef, he brings him to his bedside, and he tells him, I gave you something. Natati lachem, I gave you shechem echad. I'm giving you shechem, one up on your brothers. That's what Yaakov tells Yosef. And, um, and then y- 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 Yaakov says something interesting. He says, Asher lakachti, that I took this place, this, this city, shechem, becharbi, I took it with my sword and with my bow. And famously, famously, um, we read a little bit about what that means. What is this charbi and kashti that Yaakov is saying to Yosef? So I've given you this shechem echad alachecha, one city on top of your inheritance, Eretz Israel. I'm giving you this uh, extra city, shechem. And you should just know, I took it with my sword and with my bow. Now, I think that there's two questions that need to be asked immediately when you see this. Question number one. Did not the entire story of Yosef and his brothers begin? Because Yaakov gave something to Yosef that he didn't give to the brothers. What's going on? Point number one. Point number two. <clears throat> Point number two is um, the idea that Yaakov Avinu says, I took this land, this city, with my sword and with my bow. Let's just review. What happens in Shechem? How does, how does Yaakov get Shechem? Shimon and Levi. Why does Yaakov say that I took it with my sword and my bow? In fact, if memory serves us correctly, take a look back, what do you see? That Yaakov Avinu chastises Shimon and Levi and tells them, what have you done to me? You've gone to war against these people. You've now exposed me to everyone in the neighborhood coming to fight against me. So, what does it mean that Yaakov says, I'm going to give it to Yosef, uh, this land that I took, Becharbi Bekashti? Now, the, the Chachamim tell us that when Shimon and Levi went around the city, Yaakov went to protect them. He stood outside the city to make sure that no one else came in. He was the fortification of that war from the outside. Still, hardly appropriate to say that he took Shechem. Even if he was protecting from the outside. So the Unculus, the translation of Unculus, comes and shares with us something amazing. He says, What does Becharbi u Bekashti mean? Bitsloti u Bibauti. Tsloti, where does that word come from? Right, we say it in the Kaddish, Tslotehon. What does that mean? Our prayers. What does Bauti mean? Bibau minach means we ask from you. So bibauti means with my requests from God. So there are two different forms of prayer. One form of prayer is uh, praying, tzloti. One form of prayer is bauti, in asking something, in needing something, in requesting something. Okay? Yaakov Avinu is effectively telling Yosef something very interesting. 
He's saying it's true that Shimon and Levi took this land, and the way that they took this land was by um, was by uh, uh, their sword and their bow, so to speak. But actually, if you, if you look at the Pesukim, actually, you don't see the word bow in Shimon and Levi either. What Yaakov Avinu was saying is, Ele barechev, ve'ele basusim, ve'anachnu, Hashem, 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 We, the way we wage battle is with our prayers, is with our tefilot, with our zechuyot. So Yaakov Avinu says, of course they went and did the actual physical act of fighting. But what won a war of one family versus an entire city, what won that war was my prayers uh, to be able to protect Am Yisrael. We find this idea when the Jewish people are fighting Amalek, where Moshe Rabbeinu's hands are raised to the heavens. And the Chachamim tell us, uh, what is the Pasuk trying to communicate? That your, Moshe's hands of Ayi Yadav Emuna, his hands are Emuna. As Moshe's hands are up in the heavens, everyone is praying to Hashem, they're winning the war. What happens when his hands come down? Vigavar Amalek, and Amalek would win. When the hands were up, when the trust was there, they would win the war. When the hands came down, what would happen? Vigavar Amalek. Yaakov has no doubt whatsoever about what wins the war, and therefore he can say to Yosef unequivocally, Asher Lakachti, that I took, Beharbi u Bekashti. My friends, our first lesson for today is in understanding the power of prayer. You know, <laughs> what's interesting is you take a, a child and you put the child on your shoulders. And little children, what do they say when you put the child on the, you put your child on your shoulders? They say, "Look, I'm taller than mommy." Honey, you're not taller than mommy. I'm taller than mommy. You're sitting on my shoulders. So now you're taller than mommy, but you're not taller than mommy. You're roughly the size of a teddy bear. You're taller than mommy because you're sitting on my shoulders. It's very easy in difficult times to lean on prayer. It is not as easy after the victory to be able to say that the victory belongs to the prayer. It belongs to God. It's very hard to do that. So Yaakov, who's able to do that, says to Yosef very, very clearly, I'm giving you Shechem. Now, I want to share one other element that I think is important. If you remember, where did they go? In the beginning of the story of the brothers and Yosef, where did they go? Where? Dotan. Dotan. Excellent. But before they went to Dotan, where were they? They were in Shechem. Yaakov sends Yosef to his brothers to see them in Shechem. He gets there, he can't find them. He asks the man, the man says, I heard them saying that they're going Dotana. And the Pasuk over there says a very interesting language. The man who our rabbis tell us was actually the angel Gabriel, says to Yosef, Naseu Mizeh. They traveled from here. Now, that's a very strange word to use when you're trying to say here. How do you say here in Hebrew? Kan. It should have said Nasu Mikan. Mizeh, Nasu Mizeh. They traveled from this. Or you could say Mizeh HaMakom, from this place. But Nasu Mizeh is a very strange language. Listen carefully. Listen carefully to what the Chachamim tell us. Ze, Zayin, Hey, is Gematria 12. What Gabriel was hinting to Yosef is that the brothers have moved on from the idea of 12. They've made peace that the family is no longer a family of 12 Shvatim. It's going to become a family of 11 Shvatim. Nase'u Mizeh. 
Another interpretation is that what happened in the city of Shechem was that the brothers stood up for one of their own. Should our sister be treated like a prostitute? We're going to take revenge. That means that here was a place where family was something that you fought for. Says Gabriel to Yosef, They traveled away from this idea, not just this place. My friends, if that's the case, Yaakov Avinu, who in the end of his life is giving these berachot, everything Yaakov is doing is with nivuah at this stage. He calls in the boys, switches his hands. Yosef goes nuts, what are you doing? It's the wrong thing, you did this with us. You're putting the younger kid in front of the older kid. What does Yaakov tell Yosef? Yadati bini yadati. I know, my son, I know. But the younger one, is going to become greater than the older one. And therefore, I've switched my hands and I put my right hand on the younger one. Yaakov is giving with nivuah. In the future, who is Ephraim going to become? Bigger than Menashe. Yaakov gives each shevet a bracha exactly according to what they need and foretells many events that are only going to happen centuries in the future. Everything is happening in nivuah. So while Yaakov does not physically know what happened in Shechem, he doesn't know what went down. He doesn't know what happened to Yosef. As we said the other day, Yosef says to Yaakov, he has to call, excuse me, Yaakov has to call Yosef down to his bed. Why? Because in all the years, Yosef avoided spending time with his father alone because he was scared Yaakov would ask him, point blank what happened, he wouldn't be able to lie and he would need to tell his aging father what had happened with his brothers. In order not to do that, Yosef denied himself so many hours of studying Torah with his father. He denied himself that connection, that, that closeness that he was craving for so many years. Yosef truly was et achai anochim evakesh. He truly wanted nothing more than the, wel the welfare of his brothers and the peace and harmony amongst his family. So even though Yaakov did not know what happened, his nivuah absolutely knew. Where do we find this? Miteref beni alita. He says to Yehuda. He uses the words of Tarof Toraf Yosef. He tells Yehuda, you have risen from teref beni. What does that mean if he doesn't know about Yosef? However, my friends, Yaakov is speaking with Emuna. So what does he say to Yosef? And I have given you Shechem Achad Al Achecha. I gave you one. I gave you one portion called Shechem. And you know where that's coming from? You know, you walk into a into a bar, into a restaurant, you want to feel large, you see a dear friend, your rabbi, you see a chatan kala, you wave your hand to the waiter, you say, alai, on me. Right? What does Rivka say to Yaakov? Alai, kilalatecha beni. Right? On me. Yaakov says to Yosef, I gave you one portion, the city of Shechem. Al-Achecha, that comes on the cheshbon of your brothers. What went down in Shechem makes that a place that needed a kapara, that needed a rectification. And that rectification, the nase'u mizeh, meant that that portion needed to go to Yosef. What I find fascinating as well is the idea itself that the word Shechem, it represents a city. It represents shoulder, right? We say, right? right? We say, Al Shechmam, the Jewish people left with their goods wrapped up, Al Shechmam, on their shoulders. So Shechem means shoulder. Shechem is the name of a city. 
Shechem is the name of a rasha. So we find the same word represents three different things. And I think that the idea is very simple and very straightforward. What happens when Yosef re reconciles with his father, uh, gets to meet his father again, reconciles with his brothers? You see, Yosef and Benjamin are busy crying on each other's shoulders. He cries on the shoulders of his father. When a person gives someone, literally, a shoulder to cry on, they support that person, that gives a person incredible strength. When a person is not given that support, what happens? The lack of that being the definition of Shechem, it becomes a Rasha. A person who does not feel supported, who does not feel that there's love there, connection there, from the people around them, for whatever reason. A lot of times we feel it's justified, but what we can't forget is that while we see that person in a certain way, and therefore we think they need discipline or punishment or ramifications or consequences, a lot of times the person in question, they don't see their actions that way. And since they don't see their actions that way, how do they see your punishment, consequences, whatever? They see it as hatred, as anger, as misplaced criticism. The lack of shechem, of a shoulder, resulted in shechem, what could have become a rasha. What results in a rasha, shechem, turns an entire city. Turns an entire city to defend that rasha. Because that rasha is a leader. What Yaakov is saying to the brothers is, when you push Yosef out, he doesn't know what he's saying. Like the language of Chazal says, so beautifully says, Niva velo yada mash niva. We know that you pushed Yosef out by not supporting him, by not supporting his dreams. You turn a person like that who's a leader into a rasha, what happens? It's not just that he becomes bad or, or weak or wicked or evil. He turns the whole city after him. Imagine Yosef becomes a Rashat Mirusha and then takes over Mitzrayim. What would have happened there? What kind of impact could Yosef have had on those people? Or even on his own family who would then be forced to come to live in the city. What if instead of giving his brothers Goshen, he took his brothers and he separated them, put them all in different cities? What if he shut down the yeshiva that Yaakov sent Yehuda to build in, in Mitzrayim? What would have happened then? So Yaakov says, Yosef, you turned it around. You, you merited something. You merited Shechem Echad Alachecha. One definition of Shechem on your brothers. My friends, why am I sharing this with you? Because I think that the story of Yehuda and Yosef is a very powerful story about what it means to support the people we love even when they are going through a stage, a time, and they're presenting themselves in a way that we don't necessarily love so much. We don't like the way they acted. We don't like what they said. We don't like what they did. So what do you do? You punish them by giving them the cold shoulder, by not supporting, by not hanging out. That lack of support, what happens in that critical moment when the person needs it so much, causes them to fall. And people don't forget so easily who wasn't there to catch them. You know, in team building exercises, there's an idea that they always use. You know what they call it? They call it a trust fall. You know what that means? To have your coworkers, your friends, your family, whoever it is, stand behind you, fold your arms, close your eyes, now just fall. The person behind you catches you. What's the aim of the exercise in the trust fall, obviously, to build trust? If I could fall and you'll catch me, then you know what? I know I can trust. I can live life with trust. My friends, I want you to imagine you're a group of friends. You get everyone together. You take one guy in the group. You tell him, close your eyes. 
We're going to catch you. Closes his eyes, does his thing, falls. Everyone lets him fall. They stand around and laughing. Do you think that guy ever is going to fall for that again? But what if later on he needs his friends and he needs them to catch him and he needs them to support him? You think he's making that mistake of being vulnerable, of falling on them, expecting them to catch him? Never again. There's no Shechem in the right time. You turn a person into the most unscrupulous person. You turn a person into a person who doesn't have integrity, who doesn't allow themselves to be authentic, who does whatever they do and feels like whatever means necessary, you know, because I'm by myself. I'm doing it alone. I don't have people. That's the message of Yosef receiving Shechem Echad Alachecha. And I started with a question, and the question was, how could Yaakov do this? Isn't it going to make the brothers jealous? You think it's going to make the brothers jealous when out of all the places in Israel, the one city he chose was the city where everything, this whole saga began? Every one of them will know. Every one of them would say, the second they heard this, fair dues. Okay. I hope dad was in nivuah mode when he did this and not in conscious mode. Are you with me? That's the message, I think, um, that we need to be able to uh, I- exhibit. Today, we've witnessed an Am Yisrael that has given so many shoulders. An Am Yisrael that has stood by families, that has stood by uh, uh, its, its tzahal, that has not forgotten for one second, uh, not for one minute of one day, uh, all those that are missing. It's an amazing thing. But my friends, I want to caution for one thing. Sometimes it can be easier to support a family across the globe. It can be easier to support uh, Yatom, Almana, and Eretz Israel than it can be to support your very own brother, to support your very own sister your very own parents. A lot of times I hear, you know, Rabbi, what am I supposed to do? Guy's gonna come to me now, and then what? He's gonna come to me again, he's gonna come to me again, he's gonna come to me again. I I hear the concern. Help him now. Help them now. What will happen if they come again? We'll deal with it then. You'll ask yourself, can I help them now? Am I capable of helping them now? Are they at a place right now where if I help them this once more, they're going to turn into a perpetual basket case, always asking for my help? But right now, do you have the wherewithal to be able to do something for them? Shechem Echad. Could you give one shoulder? It's a very powerful lesson that we're learning. Hashem should bless us, Be'ezat Hashem, to be the ones that always have shoulders to give. Hashem should bless us to be the ones that have that stability. And instead of feeling like, wow, I can't believe it, everyone's relying on me, thank Hashem every day and every night that you're the lucky one that Hashem blessed with the wherewithal, financial, emotional, intellectual, spiritual, to be a rock for other people. Uh, for other family members, may Hashem bless us to learn the lessons of our past so that we should be zocher not to repeat them in the future. Baruch Amen. Amen.